please join me in the opening prayer found in your bulletin. O Lord, God Almighty, immortal, invisible, the mysteries of whose being are unsearchable, accept our praises for the revelation which you have made of yourself, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, three persons and one God, and have mercifully grant that ever holding vast this faith, we may magnify your glorious name, who lives and reigns, one God, world without end. Amen. Somerset Congregational Church and welcome those people that are joined with us online. If you happen to be new today, there's an information card in the pew in front of you. If you don't mind filling that out, putting that in the offering plate, we'd really appreciate it. Uh, if you look at the back of your bulletin, the announcements, there's quite a few, so kind of bear with me here. Today, there's a special business meeting, but I want to note that the meeting is going to be downstairs, not in the sanctuary. Very exciting, as you all know, Life Action Summit Conference is coming October 30th through the 6th. Uh, please see Pastor Lucas. We still have meat for that, as you see there. Um, also, Helping Hands, which we've done before, the Pregnancy Crisis Center in Hillsdale is doing their annual baby bottle campaign. And those are on a little table there at the back. I think we've done this for several years, uh, helping them out. It's a great cause. And, uh, try to take take a look at that if you can. Uh, Hillsdale County Fair Church Service in the Bandstand at 2 p.m. Wednesday, free. Rodeo in the Grandstands at 7. Next Sunday, this is important, there will be potluck. It's after the service. So we've been doing the coffee hours in between. There will still, we're going to try to do coffee, but... Just to note, the potluck will be after the service, like it always is. And as you know, if you're new with us, we're doing a Christian education hour from 9 to 10, and then fellowship and food from 10 to 10.30. Are there any other announcements? Linda. Uh, I have two. First of all, both of them are about pies. I know it sounds like it's <laughs> over and it's not real late again, but, uh, but we have a surplus of pie crust. And Sounds like a great deal. Bernie. Mr. Bernie. Yes, sir. Well, I'd like to thank everybody and appreciate the 
good thoughts and the prayers and the get well cards. I want to know this coming week whether the cancer has all been eradicated from surgery or if I've got to have continued uh, treatment. Uh, the other thing is I announced last week the new fit pumpkin patch is open. People from the church can disregard the sign that says cash. Give yourself a pumpkin. And the last but not least, uh, you know, Linus told Charlie Brown there is a big pumpkin. And he's at the Hillsdale County Fair and he weighs a thousand pounds. Come and see. Him. Is that your pumpkin, no, Bernie? Not. <laughs> well, you had a couple big pumpkins I too, had right? A couple big ones there, yeah, but they don't weigh a thousand pounds. All right, so two great opportunities. Buy a Pie Crusher 250, go pick a pumpkin for free at Mr. Bernie's. Any other announcements? See none, we'll move on to our responsive reading. Today it's in your pew Bible in front of you on page 890. It's Psalm 52. And I'm going to read a little intro here as we've been doing as we walk through the book of Psalms together, the books of Psalms. This psalm enables the faithful to develop God's confidence in care and protection, particularly when surrounded by ruthless enemies. The title sets the psalm during David's flight from King Saul in 1 Samuel 21, which led to the slaughter at Nob of the priest who had helped David. David's enemy, Doge, the Edomite reported to Saul about the priest's hospitality to David. When none of Saul's Israelite men would strike the priest down as commanded by Saul, Doge willingly did so. He is thus an example of the enemies that the faithful might face. So we're going to read Psalm 52. I'm going to read the, the odd verses if you'll respond with even. even. Psalm 52. Why do you boast of evil, you mighty man? Why do you boast all day long, you who are a disgrace in the eyes of God? Your tongue plots destruction, and his light is sharp and razor, you who practice deceit. You love evil rather than good, falsehood rather than speaking the truth. You love every harmful word, O oh, you deceitful tongue. Surely God will bring you down to everlasting ruin. He will snatch you up and tear you from your tent. He will uproot you from the land of the living. The righteous will see and fear. They will laugh at him, saying, Here now is the man who did not make God his stronghold, but trusted in his great wealth and grew strong by destroying others. But I am like an hollow tree, Flourishing in the house of God, and I trust in God's unveiling love forever and ever. I will praise you forever for what you have done. In your name I will hope, for your name is good. I will praise you in the presence of saints. That's the word of God for us this morning. And now we're going to have a couple uh, songs up on the PowerPoint. 10,000 rings and King of Kings. Stand if you're able. Bless the Lord, all my soul. 
say that that was a new song, first time singing it here. You guys did a great job. We're going to sing it next week as well, uh, help us familiarize ourselves with it. But let's turn to prayer now. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that you are the King of Kings, that you are sovereign, that you are ruler over all. As we talked about this morning in our uh, education hour with the teens, there is no place that we can go where you are not present. You are everywhere at once. And Father, that's good news for us. For when we go through hardships and difficulties, it means that you are there as well. Now we confess, Father, many times our awareness of you, that changes, absolutely. Depending on where we are, what we're experiencing, how busy our day is. But Father, that doesn't mean that you aren't present with us. You are. So Father, we give you the thanks concerning that today. Father, we pray that we would not be like evil men. That we would not be boasting in our own strength. That our tongues would not be used to tear others down. Father, instead, that we might bring others up, that we might be a source of peace. Father, you call us as Christians to be peacemakers in our world. May we do so. Father, we are thankful, as it says in verse 8 of Psalm 52, that you have planted us like an olive tree near you, near your presence, and that as we trust in your unfailing love, Father, we know we will continue to grow stronger and stronger, more mature and mature. So, Father, as verse 9 says, it is our glory to praise you forever for what you have done. It is our hope. Your name is our hope. And that, Father, we praise you in the presence of your saints. And that's what we do this morning. We can praise you on our own anytime, but we can't praise you in the presence of saints unless we're gathered together with the saints to sing your praises. So, Father, we pray that our praises today would be found acceptable before you. We love you. We give you thanks. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, at this time, the children would like to come forward for the children's message. <laughs> get everything? Yes. I mean, <laughs> is there anything your parents want that they don't have? Uh, yes. Oh, there is? But, it, like, do you ask for stuff and sometimes, like, most of the time your parents tell you no. Like, you guys want lots of stuff to go to the store and you, the parents get whatever they want, but you don't get anything, right? So, how does that make you feel? Man. Well, I'm here to tell you, you got a friend in Jesus. Because in Matthew 19, 
verses 13 through 15. Then the children were brought to Jesus, that he might lay his hands on them and pray. The disciples rebuked the people. So this is kind of like your parents, okay, rebuking you. But Jesus said, quote, let the little children come to me, and do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of heaven. So Jesus is saying that no matter what your parents say, you get the kingdom of heaven. Does that sound like a pretty good deal? Yeah. 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 So when you get older like your parents, all you have to do is believe in Jesus, that he came to this earth, died and rose again for the forgiveness of your sins, and you can have eternal life. You can live forever with Jesus. And it ends in 15, and he laid his hands on them and went away. So this morning you got the greatest gift from Jesus, the kingdom of heaven. And when you get older and you learn more about Jesus, you can believe in him, that he came, died, rose again for the forgiveness of your sins. And you can live forever with him in heaven. Is that like the greatest gift ever? No, that's not the greatest gift ever. Oh, we got a dispute up here. All right, let's pray. Dear Jesus, we thank you for these children and for the family they represent. We thank you for this congregation. We continue to lay your hands upon them, whether it's in children's church or activities, with all the things that we do. We ask you to be with these children as we go down to children's church and through the rest of the week. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Children are dismissed for children's church. As the kids head downstairs, we'll turn our attention to prayer. We have a couple of prayer requests already come in, and we're going to pray for Bernie, and he gave us an update during the welcome, so we're thankful for that, and that the surgery went well for him. Uh, Mike's here today. Mike's got a lot of family in the Tampa area, and there is a hurricane barreling towards uh, that area at about Wednesday, correct? So we want to pray for safety for his kids in that whole area, and hopefully he gets diverted to Alabama. You know, we let it go there at least, right? Forget Tampa. No, that's where my, my family is in Alabama, so Mississippi. How about that? So hopefully the hurricane uh, decreases in strength and becomes just a, hopefully a tropical storm, but we'll see what happens. Uh, also want to pray this upcoming weekend, uh, myself, Matt Shaw, and Jesse Schmidt, we are heading over to Life Action Camp for a father-son retreat. They're staying the whole weekend. I'm going to be coming back Saturday night, so I'll be with you guys next Sunday. But we're praying for uh, Max and Ryan, and I believe both Caleb and George, I think, are going. Is that right, Stacia? Yeah. So I uh, hope hopefully we have a wonderful time bonding with our boys and having and hearing from god's word this weekend how else can we be in prayer how can we be in prayer this morning any prayer requests jim and then ruth my sister oh. came home i guess ruth too. first all right yeah. your, your sister barbara came home yeah and uh, she just has to heal up from this phase and she's got more to have done but yep with with her back right yes yeah, yeah. Jim, I should have said ladies first. I mean, I should have said it right off the bat. So, Jim. That's right. I just wanted to uh, ask if you dry weather. Yep. Saturday. Yeah. So, uh, Saturday, Jim is having the big auction up at his place. Um, so, we hopefully great weather and hopefully great turnout. And hopefully you put in some plants like Bernie who's driving up the prices on everybody. All right. So. I also want to thank those who. And uh, hopefully it's done some good. Yeah. We we'll see some advances in the way and then some advances. That's great. What was your name? No. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things, of course, is uh, this COVID stuff. We can suffer different reactions. And I have to be one of them to be, happens to be uh, remembering names. Yeah. And uh, the fact that my handwriting is different, the fact that 
Your handwriting can't be worse, Jim. So. <laughs> yeah. For those of you online, Jim was just thanking for rides and visits and just the care and concern that we show him, and hopefully he and definitely understands the love that we have for him and the care. So. Yeah. One book I kept or message if it was the one that. She knows who she is. I'm in the okay. so I'll use this to my advantage. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it says never stop laughing. Yep. And, uh, that's some, some good. All right, you still got your sense of humor. That's wonderful. Thank you, Jim. Any other prayer requests today? All right, well, let's join together in prayer, shall we? Our Father, it's wonderful to be in your presence this morning, to be with you, to be with your people to be able to sing your praises, to be able to hear from your word, to be able to share in each other's uh, encouragements and griefs, which is why we pray this morning. Father, we pray for Ned and Marlene McGrady. We're thankful for their wonderful work. We pray for them specifically. They have a couple of conferences coming up, uh, one called Pastors and Missionary Conference over this weekend and next week, and then one coming up in November called Global Healthcare Mission Member. So we pray for them as they not sure if they're attending or serving or leading, whatever capacity they're in, that you would bless their, their work. And Father, we pray for Marlene as she's going to have corrective surgery on her foot uh, coming up next month, November 9th. And we pray that that would go well for her. Father, we're thankful for all the people in our church. And you know, we're not a big church, but we have a lot of people who are willing to help with the kids, which obviously is a very important ministry with every church. The, uh, you called us to pass on the good news of Jesus Christ, pass on uh, the truths of the Bible to the next generation. And we're doing that. And I'm thankful for people like Courtney and Susan and Stacia, Beth, Megan, and Karen, who uh, actively are participating and leading the, the students and kids. And we just pray that you would continue to give them excitement to reach the little ones in our church. Father, we pray for Bernie. We're thankful to hear that the surgery went well. We pray that he gets a good report this week as he um, waits to hear back about uh, con concerning the, the cancer that they can find anymore if it seems to have been uh, taken away with the surgery. Father, we pray for the upcoming Summit Conference. We pray that you would prepare our hearts to seek you as we gather together, that you would be with us in a powerful way, Father, that this would be uh, a week where uh, lives are changed, our church is changed for the better, continue to grow more deeper, more passionate for you. And we have a few needs, Father, so we pray that you would help us to fill those within our church family. Uh, we need one more uh, home to host two students. We need three more vehicles, Father, and I think a couple more dinners. So I pray that you would lead people in our church to be able to step up and um, help meet those needs. Father, we pray for uh, Mike's kids and, and grandkids who are in the Tampa area as they, this storm potentially is kind of bullseyeing Tampa. We certainly pray that this hurricane will decrease. It will not be as strong as it is being predicted right now. And we pray certainly that you keep them safe. And whatever the aftermath is, I pray that your church will be able to step up and step in to show help and concern for their neighbors and show the love of Jesus Christ. Father, I pray for myself and Jesse and Matt as we get ready to head over to uh, Life Action Camp for this Father's Son Retreat. And we certainly pray for our boys, uh, Ryan and Max and George and, and Caleb, uh, that you would continue to do a wonderful work in their hearts, growing them to, in, to become men who seek after you. Uh, help us as dads be able to connect and enjoy uh, our time together, and we just pray you have a great Father-Son Retreat next weekend. And, and I should say, I also pray for uh, Matt Helmichangus and Lucas, who are there at the retreat this weekend. Um, we scheduled and work out to make it with us next weekend, but we pray for them as they're there, and that hopefully it was a great weekend for those two. Father, we pray for Ruth's sister, Barbara. We're thankful to hear the news about her. It sounds like there's still a long way to go. The back is... Uh, a tender area. So we pray that you would help her with 
uh, and the medical professional not only with pain management, but also that she would experience true healing. And Father, we're thankful that Jim is with us today. We pray for a good day weather-wise this upcoming Saturday uh, for the auction at his house. And we're thankful for all the people in the church who have stepped up to show their love and concern and just however the way they can help Jim uh, visiting or giving him rides. Uh, thank you that it's just a sign of uh, what a church family ought to be. And Father, at this time, we quiet our hearts before you to bring any other uh, requests we didn't mention, words of praise or thanksgiving or even confession. Hear now the prayers of your people. Father, as we continue with the service, especially as we come to the reading of your word and the message, I pray that you would give me strength by your spirit to preach for us to hear what it is you have for us today. Your word is true, it is faithful, it is powerful. I pray that it would go out among us and do good works, produce fruit to glorify you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this time we'll continue our worship with the giving of our tithes and offerings. If I have my ushers come forward to receive that, please. that your name may be glorified and the good news of Jesus spread forth. Father, we pray this morning as your Son taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. This morning's scripture comes from the book of Acts. As we continue our series, chapter 8, verses 26 through 40. <clears throat> Hear the word of the Lord this morning. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Rise and go toward the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert place. And he rose and went. And there was an Ethiopian, a eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning, seated in his chariot, and he was reading the prophet Isaiah. And the spirit said to Philip, Go. Over and join this chariot. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and asked, Do you understand what you are reading? 
And he said, how can I, unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now the passage of the scripture that he was reading was this. This is from Isaiah 53. Like a sheep he was led to the slaughter, and like a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he opens not his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. Then Philip opened his mouth, beginning with the scripture, he told him the good news about Jesus. And the eunuch said to Philip, about whom I ask you, does the prophet say this about himself or about someone else? I apologize, I just realized I just flip-flopped two slides. So the next slide should say, Then Philip opened his mouth and began with the scripture, he told him the good news about Jesus. And as they were going along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What prevents me from being baptized? And he commanded the chariot to stop, and they both went down into the water, Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord carried Philip away, and the eunuch saw him no more, and went on his way rejoicing. And Philip found himself at Azotus. And as he passed through, he preached the gospel to all the towns until he came to Caesarea. That is the word of the Lord for us this morning. I, I believe most of you know that uh, the original language of the Bible is not English or even King James English. It's Hebrew in the Old Testament and Greek in the New Testament. I know you're shocked, Terry. And I usually don't start out with Greek words, but I'm going to start the sermon with this Greek word. This word is soon aragon. And if you break it down, the prefix is sum, and it is the Greek prefix for with. And ergon is the Greek word for work. It's where we get, for example, ergonomics, that is like the study of the workplace. So this word literally means with work, and the defi- how it's used is it means co-worker, or partner, or a fellow worker. That's what this Greek word means. And we see it in passages like Romans 16, 3, where Paul writes, Greet uh, Presica and Aquila, my fellow workers. That's where that word comes in, sunergon, in Christ Jesus. We see it also in 2 Corinthians 8, 23. Paul says, As for Titus, he is my partner and fellow worker, my sunergon, for your benefit. Okay, so in these passages, Paul is talking about a fellow co-worker. But here's where it gets really interesting in the next passage. In 1 Thessalonians 3, 2, we, read, we find this word in this context. And we sent Timothy, our brother, and God's, soon Aragon, God's co-worker in the gospel of Christ. Huh. Well, that's a little different. I mean, it's one thing to be a co-worker of Paul's, but to say that someone, even someone as awesome as Timothy, is God's partner, God's fellow worker, God's co-worker is amazing. But maybe it's just because Timothy, you know, is a one-off amazing Christian. Well, check out this verse. 1 Corinthians 3, 9, where Paul writes that for we, for Christians, we Christians, are all implied God's soon ergon. We are all God's co-workers, God's fellow workers, God's partners in his work. Now, this is an extraordinary idea on two accounts. First, it's extraordinary because God doesn't make us do all the work. Now, that might seem a little less extraordinary to you, but in Paul's day, in the days of of the Bible, this, of course, would have been a huge uh, counter-cultural idea. For example, in the Akkadian culture, uh, it was expected that the reason why the gods created humans was to do their work for them. Let me read you from the Akkadian creation account. Great indeed was the drudgery of the gods. The forced labor was heavy. The misery too much. The gods were digging watercourses, canals. They heaped up all the mountain years of drudgery. They counted years of drudgery and 40 years too much. Forced labor they bore night and day. They were complaining, denouncing, muttering down in the ditch. Sounds like my teens, actually. Every day the outcry was loud. We could hear the clamor. 
There is, and this is the name of one of their gods, Bolet Eli, who was considered a midwife. And they say, let her create a human, a man, and let him bear the yoke. Let him bear the yoke. Let man assume the drudgery of the gods. So you can see back in their day, the idea that uh, God would be do any of the work was a countercultural idea for uh, the surrounding areas. That the idea was, well, the gods created us to do their work for them. That's why we are here. Now, that's a little less extraordinary to us, but the second reason why this idea is extraordinary, I think, is more applicable for us today. And that is, this is an amazing idea because God, it means that God doesn't do all the work himself. Many times we think that, why are we even here? What are we doing? God's all-powerful. God's sovereign. He doesn't need us. The creator of billions and billions of galaxies each with billions and billions of stars, each with billions and billions of planets, he doesn't need us. He can do it himself. And we, and we recognize that is true. God doesn't need us. And yet we read here in 1 Corinthians 3, 9, that we are God's fellow workers. That God desires that we partner with him. And we find out this is actually not a new idea. This was God's plan from the beginning. You can think of Adam and Eve. When God created Adam and Eve, he called them to work the garden. He called them to rule the animals. He called them to subdue the earth, things that God could do himself. God didn't need them to do that. And then this was continued with Jesus. You can think of his last words to his disciples, this very famous verse from Acts we've looked at over and over again. We'll look at it one more time, where Jesus says this, But you, speaking to his followers, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. Again, God really doesn't need them to be his witnesses. God could be his own witness if he wants to. But still, God calls us to be his fellow workers. And yet, I can almost know for certain that all of us, sometimes we think back in our lives, or even currently right now, uh, have had co-workers that have been a delight and co-workers that have been a drain. Rock, are you still working over at, uh, where are you working? I forget the, not the, is it Fleet Farm? Where are you working? Yeah, Tractor Supply. I bet if I put you on the spot, you could probably think of some great co-workers and probably a few you would rather not be working with, if that's correct. That's correct. Yeah, that's correct. <laughs> I remember when I was, it was before my senior year at Hillsdale College, I spent, I lived actually in Hillsdale for the summer, and I was working down, they're closed now, but m and uh, Manufacturing down in Hudson. I had some good coworkers there, and I had this one woman who was just awful, always complaining, always slacking. It felt like she was purposely leaving her work, like, to the very end so that other people in the department, including me, would have to step up and do extra work to cover her lack of work. Just awful. And, but I remember also working in admissions at Hillsdale College. And my goodness, I had some great coworkers. There was a team atmosphere as we were going through it, looking at, at uh, you know, high school applications to the college. Uh, sometimes in the fall, you get a lot of them come in. There's big stacks. And you get kind of behind and other people step in and say, hey, you want me to read a couple of those and start working on them? Like, yeah, absolutely. And it just, it was a very wonderful team atmosphere. So we've all had good coworkers in our lives and we've had some that have not been great coworkers. The point being, God calls us to be his coworkers. That's true. We are God's coworkers, whether we like it or not. The only question is, are we going to be the type of coworkers that are helpful or the kind that are not so helpful? Are we going to be faithful co-workers for God? Well, today's passage, we're going to learn what a faithful co-worker looks like. It is someone who is attentive, obedient, and ready. Faithful co-workers, attentive, obedient, and ready. And the specific co-worker who is going to be our model for a faithful co-worker is this man named Philip, who we met last Sunday. Now, this is not the Apostle Philip, but he was an early Christian leader. He was one of the, he was part of the group of Christians that got driven from Jerusalem 
because of the persecution that broke out after uh, Stephen's martyrdom. He ends up in Samaria, and there he's preaching the good news to those awful, hated, ancient Samaritans with amazing results. Samaritans are listening, they're repenting, they're converting, and they are rejoicing. They begin to follow Jesus. There is a, there is a revival that breaks out in Samaria. But we learn here in this passage that God has other work for Philip to do beyond uh, Samaria, and God leads Philip to do different, to do some other work. And so we read this in verse 26 of our passage today. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, rise and go toward the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So here's an instance of the Lord leading Philip specifically. But this isn't the only leading. We skip down to verse 29. We're told, and the spirit said to Philip, go over and join this chariot. And beyond that, Beyond these two leadings of the Lord, we're able to see God is leading and at work in so many ways in this passage. He brings the chariot to the right spot to meet Philip. And for the, he has the eunuch reading just the right passage of the Old Testament, probably the greatest messianic prophecy, Isaiah 53. And then he has them traveling, remember, they're traveling on a desert road, and it just so happens when they start thinking about baptism, well, look at that, there's a, there's a, there's a, water source so deep they're able to submerge themselves into it. God was at work in mighty ways in this passage, and Philip was attentive to it. Now, on the one hand, you might say, well, you know, listen, if an angel of the Lord came to me with a message, I might be attentive as well, and fair enough. I mean, angel of the Lord shows up, you're probably going to sit up and like, oh, what's this all about? But even that doesn't always lead to obedience as we're going to see in just a sec. But in the second instance, in verse 29, where it says the Spirit let, said to Philip, go over and join this chariot, I don't think that was as obvious as an angel showing up with a message. Now, regardless, in both cases, Philip was attentive to the Lord's leading. And the good news is that God still leads and guides us today as well. And there are a number of ways that he leads us. The primary way, the pri the primary way he leads us is through his word, through the scriptures. And that's even highlighted in our passage today when this eunuch is reading from the book of Isaiah and Philip uses the scripture to explain and point the way to Jesus. But God also guides us by his spirit today as well, just like he led Philip by the spirit. You know, most of the time it's that gentle nudging. It's that random thought that pops in your head. And as Christians, I'm sure you've experienced this many times. Feeling, you know... Why is so-and-so on my mind today? I think I'm just going to give them a call. And you give them a call and realize, oh boy, I'm really glad I called. They really needed someone to talk to today. They really needed my advice on something. That's the, that's the, that's the Holy Spirit leading and guiding even today as well. Another example, when I was on sabbatical last summer, one of the things I was praying throughout, the, especially the beginning of the sabbatical, was, Lord, what do you want me to be focused on concerning the church? after the sabbatical. What, where do you want to lead us and guide us? What, what do you want me to be preaching on and teaching on? And as I prayed, I think the Lord answered that prayer solely guiding me to preach on prayer in the Psalms and on evangelism in the book of Acts, which is what we've been doing uh, since last fall. Now, other times, the gentle leading can also be a loud conviction from the Lord, especially when you know you have sinned and done wrong in some way. And God's Spirit's directing you to confess and repent to God and perhaps others. Now, the one thing I can promise you is that God's leading by his Holy Spirit, be it gentle or loud, will never disagree with his word. You can reject any voice or leading that would have you act contrary to the Bible. For example, the Holy Spirit will never lead you to cheat on your spouse or cheat on your taxes. But the Spirit will lead you into the work that God has around you. 100% that is true. The question is, are we giving God enough of our time and attention to realize that he's calling us to his work, to perform special tax, tasks as his co-workers? Do we give ourselves to prayer and to his word to hear from him? Are we listening for 
the Spirit's still small voice as we go about our week or we're kind of forgetful as we consolidate all our spirituality into maybe a few minutes in the morning and here on Sunday mornings. Even in the difficult persecution Philip went through, he was still attentive to the Spirit's leading in his life. May we be attentive as well, whatever season we are in. Well, besides being attentive, another attribute of a faithful co-worker is also being obedient. Now listen, that might not be necessarily true at your workplace, but when it comes to being God's co-worker, being obedient is important. Again, it's one thing to be attentive and to hear and know God has something for you to do, and it's a completely different thing to actually then go and do it. Last week we talked about the prophet Jonah. He was attentive. He knew exactly what God wanted him to do. He wanted him to take his message of salvation to those awful, awful Ninevites. He knew it. He was attentive to it. But he wasn't obedient. He had no, he had no cares at all about doing this. In fact, he did just the opposite. He tried to run away from God. He heard, he knew, and he hated, and so he disobeyed. Now, Philip had many reasons to be disobedient as well, as he heard God's call to rise and go toward the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. I mean, think about it. He is experiencing an outbreak of God's word in Samaria. There is a revival happening. These are good things. It would have been easy for Philip to say, oh, God, this can't be your voice. You must want me to stay here so I can do good works for you here. And certainly, you don't want me to go, for example, to the desert. There's no fruit there. I mean, look at how he ends, Luke ends this verse. He wants to make sure that the place that they are going is a desert place. And not only is it a desert place, this desert road leads to Gaza. That is not a city in Israel. That's a Philistine city, which is another ancient enemy, even an earlier en enemy than the Samaritans. In fact, Remember uh, Goliath, he was a Philistine. And so it had been really easy for Philip to focus on the current spiritual fruit he was experiencing and ignore the Spirit's leading. It had been really easy for him to convince himself that there's nothing in this desert place. Why go to this desert place? Or at least he could have said to himself, I'm just going to wait until God reveals himself better. I'm going to wait until this makes more sense before I go. But Philip didn't do that. Instead, he was obedient. He didn't have an explanation from God as to why he should be doing these things. He didn't need one. Nor would he wait for one. When God told Philip to leave Samaria and take the desert road to Gaza, here is Philip's response in verse 27. He rose and went. Simple obedience. He rose and he went. Didn't wait for an explanation. He simply rose and went. He took God at his word. He didn't need to have every step explained to him. He just needed to know the first step that God wanted, which is exactly the principle we see in Psalm 119, 105, which says, Your word is a lamp to my feet. Most of us know this more as, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet. But the point is, where is the lamp pointing? It's pointing at your next step, not the next mile. You don't see down the dark road. You see what's right in front of you. To be a faithful co-worker for God, we need to be attentive and obedient. And to be attentive and obedient means we got to wait on the Lord to act and direct. We can't do it on our own. we got to wait to hear from him. But this third and final attribute of a faithful co-worker that Philip models for us is one we don't need to wait on God for. In fact, we should be doing it now ahead of time. And that is we need to be ready. We need to get ourselves ready. Let's look at how Philip was ready in our passage today. As Philip was walking down the desert road, he came across a chariot, and that's where we pick up the story in verse 29. And the Spirit said to Philip, Go over and join this chariot. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and asked, Do you understand what you are reading? And he said, How can I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come and sit with him. See, in this instance, Philip was ready with a great question to the eunuch that got the conversation going and gave the eunuch an opportunity to invite Philip in. Continuing in verse 32. Now the passage of the scripture that he was reading was this. 
Like a sheep, he was led to the slaughter, and like a lamb before it shears is silent, so he opens not his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. And the eunuch said to Philip, About whom, I ask you, does the prophet say this? About himself or about someone else? Then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning with the scripture, he told him the good news about Jesus. Now, let me ask you a question. If a friend of yours called you up and said, Hey, I was reading my Bible. I know, I know. I haven't. Why am I reading the Bible? I haven't read my Bible since I was a kid. I don't know. I just felt I should pick it up and read it. But hey, I was reading this section, and it said this. Like a sheep that was led to the slaughter, and like a lamb before it shears is silent, so he opens not his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. I was reading that, and I don't get it. Do you, can you explain to me what this means? If someone were to ask you that, would you be able to answer the question? What does this mean? Who is this talking about? Would you be able to point to Jesus? If another friend called you up and said, Hey, I know you're a Christian. I know you go to church. I got a question about the Bible. You know, what's it all about? I got a question about Jesus. What, what's he all about? What's, what's his message? Would you be able to respond clearly? Would you be able to be a faithful co-worker for God? Philip was because he knew God's word. He knew the big story of the Bible, what it's all about. He knew the good news of Jesus Christ. He knew how the Bible was, all of it was pointing to Jesus. And Philip knew how to communicate these things to others clearly. Friends, we have the extraordinary privilege of being called soon ergon, being called God's partners, God's co-workers, God's fellow workers in this great story, this great outworking of God's salvation. But the question is, will we be faithful co-workers? Will we be attentive to God's spirit in our lives? Will we be obedient to whatever God calls us to do, to whomever God calls us to? And will we be faithful ahead of time to be ready by knowing God's word, being able to explain it, being able to show how everything points to Jesus. If so, then this passage from Romans 10 will be said about you. Romans 10. For everyone who calls in the name of the Lord will be saved. But how are they to call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. May it be said of us that we have beautiful feet because we are faithful soon ergon, faithful co-workers with God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, it is both humbling and extremely beyond our imaginations that you would call us your co-workers. That you call us to participate in your great outworking of salvation in this world. Father, may we take our responsibility seriously. May we not shirk our duties. May we be faithful co-workers to you. May we be attentive to hearing your spirit lead us in our lives. May we be obedient to whatever the Spirit calls us to say or to do. And Father, may we, may we be ready for those leadings by studying your word and being in prayer. Because we know as we do those, pray and read and gather together like this on Sunday mornings, it helps us to, better, to be better able to hear you lead and speak into our lives. Father, help us to be faithful co-workers to your glory. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our final hymn this morning, Our God Reigns, is 229, and it speaks about how beautiful the feet of those who preach good news. So if you're able to, please stand as we sing our final hymn, Our God Reigns, number 229. We're going to do the, the three main verses that are... There's a couple extra verses on the right-hand side. We're just going to do the main verses today.
declares himself, that even God, even our Father, who has loved us and has given us everlasting consolation and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts, establish you in every good word and word. May it be so to his glory today. Amen. <laughs>